Welcome to Brave. Be inspired by the best leaders of Southeast Asia tech. Build the future, learn from our past, and stay human in between. I'm Jeremy Ao, a VC, founder, and father. Join us for transcripts, analysis, and community at www.jeremyao.com. Hi, Michi. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. This incredible story that I'm happy to share about you building up kind of career in the Philippines. Obviously, your background in Harvard and Harvard MBA. So talk about having odd logos and Bain. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I think you have a great heart and I'm just excited to share about what you are so excited to build. Thanks. Yeah, I'm excited to share our story. It's a little bit unconventional, but I think people might find it interesting as a way to get started. We are happy to share. So tell us about yourself, Michi. Yeah. So as you said, my name is Michi. I am a born and bred Filipina. So very, very proud Pinoy over here. I grew up in the Philippines up until I was 18. And then I actually moved to the States to Harvard College, as you mentioned earlier. I studied sociology there because I was very interested in communities and systems and organizations and how they operate within this complex web of how society comes together. After that, I actually started my journey into education. So I fell in love with working with young people and teaching youth. And so I actually was teaching eighth grade for a year in my last year of college. And after that, like ventured into ed tech. So I worked at an ed tech company for a year when I was in the U.S. And unfortunately, the visa process didn't work out for me as an international student at that time. So I had to leave, but I actually consider it a blessing in disguise because it led me to find an education startup in Africa called the African Leadership University, where I eventually then decided to work as a learning experience designer. So I was there for two years, really understanding what makes students click, how do they learn best, what ways can we actually blend online and offline in this new world of learning that we're building? And then when they launched a site in Kenya, I moved with them to Kenya, all in all three years working at the African Leadership University, um, at which point then I decided, hey, it's been a while being like an operator and being very involved in the programmatic side of startups. And I wanted to actually start to get a deeper sense of the strategic elements of it and the fundraising side as well. So I thought that it would be best to get an MBA. And that's, as you said earlier, then made my way back to Boston, back to Harvard for my MBA, where I focused a lot on continuing to understand social enterprises and how to run and scale social enterprises, but then also the VC world. So that was my first foray into the VC world. And then now, after two years, have graduated in May, I actually in the last year have been building Kata Career, which I'll be happy to talk more about later and have had like several experiences now under my belt of investing in ed tech startups across like three different VCs that I worked with during school. So it's interesting because I'm approaching this from both an operator standpoint and also an investor standpoint. But I personally like have loved the work that we're doing at Kata Career. I guess you can say I'm a mix of educator, entrepreneur, a little bit of a travel writer and blogger, and just in general, like trying to be a good global citizen as well. Yeah, that's me. Awesome. Michi, what was it like growing up in the Philippines? Oh man, I'm biased obviously, but it's the best. I think the Philippines has, or Manila specifically, which is my hometown or home city, has a perfect mix of, you know, grungy and gritty and really like exposing a kid to the real world, but then also the loving, kind of nourishing, very safe space of family Family is very big here in the Philippines as it is in several other Southeast Asian cultures. But for me, really, like it was also about just the whole phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. I really felt that way here in Manila, where obviously I had my immediate family and my parents were very formative for me. Teachers became pretty much relatives and family members. I had my extended cousins who were always around, who we always visited. We saw my grandma and my aunts and uncles every weekend, no fail, every single weekend we would see them. It really is this really big community type of growing up, community-based type of aging. And you know, I really appreciated that. And I think it's something that I missed when I went to the U.S., which is a lot more individualistic. So it's a great space. One thing that has been most exciting is seeing it from what it was before when I left for college when I was 18 
to what it has become now. I actually just got back and being in the city feels so different. Besides things like the traffic is crazy and you know, so many buildings have popped up and so many new restaurants and stuff, there really does feel some hunger for something. A lot of people are working on side hustles. A lot of people are now like starting yeah, their own thing and really trying to get it to grow. And that to me is very exciting and has always been my favorite part of Manila and actually of Southeast Asia in general. Yeah, growing up here has been has been fantastic. <laughs> Amazing. And what was it like to discover that you were going to Harvard College? What was that like? It really felt like another world. And the reason I say that is because I grew up with two parents who were both doctors. And so the pathway that had been laid out for me was pretty simple. It was basically follow the same path of being in a private all-girls Catholic school up until high school and then moving to college at the University of the Philippines, majoring in biology, exactly like my mom and then going to the UP College of Medicine, exactly like my mom and my dad. And it was going to be simple. No frills, no fancy things. It was straight shot all the way through. And then getting an international school education for high school changed all of that. So when my guidance counselors actually said, hey, like, you have the grades to be able to try to apply for some of these big schools, I was still skeptical. And I was making excuses like, oh, I wouldn't be able to afford it. I wouldn't want to leave my family, so on and so forth. But eventually, obviously, they convinced me and the financial aid packages are very, very generous at these schools. So yeah, I, I just tried it out and I did it without expectation. So the day that I found out that I got in, it was honestly just, it did felt like it wasn't me. I had this out of body experience. It sounds really dramatic, but when you're 18 and you haven't really thought about a world outside of the Philippines, it comes as a big shock to then like have all of that open to you. So it was honestly like the biggest blessing I could have ever gotten because then it just completely changed my trajectory and opened everything for me in terms of international opportunities, foraying into different types of careers, also like just experiencing different cultures and meeting different types of people. So it was a game changer for me. And I definitely think it was like the big catalyst in why I decided to be in education. And what was it like going to Harvard and America at the same time? Can you tell us what was it like? Yeah. Uh, well, I actually remember that my first impression of America was, why is everything so big? Why are the cereal boxes so big? Why are the plates so big? So on and so forth. And I found that like very fascinating at the beginning, I think. But jokes aside, I think for me, it was actually becoming a prouder Filipino. I think I realized there were things about living here in the Philippines that I took for granted. One of them is the collectivist community-based nature of living in a Philippine culture and a Philippine society. Another one for sure is just the ability of people to really have hope and optimism. Like I think in the States, like people take things for granted because of, we have the infrastructure, we have all the things like at our fingertips, even in the way that we talk about what luxury is in both places is very, very different. So I think I just started to appreciate more the things I loved about home. Not to say that I didn't learn a lot from my time there or didn't enjoy my time there because I did. I definitely became more free thinking, more opinionated, more progressive. But I think I also managed to retain some of those like classic Filipino traditions and values that for me are very important, like being family centered, caring about the community and thinking about people other than yourself and how you can impact them. So I really think that that's something that I've blended and tried to like keep in mind always, like despite all of the different learnings that we've gotten from like a Ivy League institution. It's now been a blend, an Americanized Filipino, but still Filipino at the end of the day. I do remember everything being very big. <laughs> and Harvard itself also is very much like Hogwarts. That's what I felt like when I went there. I was like, oh, this is like Harry Potter. And then, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then everyone's like, wow, you're an uneducated person. <laughs> this is what you got, you know, for comparison. <laughs> And then you are at Harvard, and what's interesting is that you make an interesting set of choices because you're starting to really work on global development, you're interested in that. So tell us more about how you started. Yeah, I actually think the big catalyst for me was one summer internship. So I did an internship when I was in the first year, so after the first year, my very first summer, at a health nonprofit in Tanzania. And at the time, I was actually still considering going into medicine because it's hard to completely just change your path after you've been taught it for 18 years. But I remember going to one of the hospitals that we were working with in Tanzania and seeing like the dismal state of the way that they were recording patient information. So basically, they had this one room that was filled from floor to ceiling 
with papers, like folders with like papers overflowing. So basically a patient would come and then the nurse would have to scan through all of those individual folders one by one and find the correct paper. Some of it was already like falling apart. Some of it had gotten wet, really, really bad system. And I remember looking at that and thinking, this is not something I need an MD for. This is not something I need a stethoscope around my neck for. This is something that Honestly, like as a student studying another discipline I could do right now. And in fact, like that summer, we were rolling out a patient registration system that people could access from their mobile devices. I had this like come to Jesus moment around, you know, do you really need to be a doctor to like make the impact that you want? And the answer very point blank was no for me. And so actually later that same year, in my second year of college, I switched over into sociology, which I felt was more aligned with community development initiatives. Yeah, understanding like local context and local cultures to be able to then assist people there or like understand how to impact their way of living. And so that kind of is what started the foray into the social impact space. And then education specifically was honestly something that I had for the longest time already loved doing. So all of my extracurriculars were always around teaching or tutoring. One of my main activities in college was I would go to a kindergarten every week to actually do two to three hours of science experiments with the kids. And that was my favorite thing to do every week easily. And so I think it just started to click more and more as I studied sociology as well that, hey, this is what I love. This is literally what I get out of bed to do every day is to work with young people and to help them grow and evolve and develop and help them along their journey, like both as a student and even after, I started to hone in more and more on that. And as I got deeper into it, I approached it from different angles. So in college, there was a lot of like pedagogy and learning about how people absorb content and what is fun for students, how to change up the classroom experience. And then it moved into ed tech. So how do we actually bring all of that online? How do we use data to assess where a student is at and then give them instructional lessons that can then like meet those gaps or fill those gaps. And then it moved into, okay, higher ed, how are we thinking about education in terms of then moving people into work and preparing them for what the future holds, which is really difficult because we don't know what the future holds. So how do we actually work backwards from that? And then now like workforce development, which is really, really tied because I think we're moving away from, okay, you have like 12 years of school and that's it into we have to be lifelong learners because the way that society is changing and the way that industries are changing is so fast paced that we can't just stick to what we learned before. So really it's like led into all of these different roles and functionalities within the education space, including being an operator to being an investor, to being a consultant as well. So multiple angles, but I can safely say for sure that it is the mountain on which I want to die, as they say. So it's like the thing that I want to peg my life on. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited to say that I have something like that. That's amazing. And what's interesting is that you've discovered what is the mountain to die on. And what's interesting is that your geography choices, because after Harvard, as part of the Filipino diaspora and community, there's a certain choice. Should we go back to Southeast Asia slash Philippines, or in your case, work in America slash across the world? So how is your thinking and thought process with that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I've been thinking about this a lot recently because someone asked me, how did you even start your work in Africa? And why is that relevant to what you're trying to do? And for me, like it really boils down to number one, we're trying to figure out how to deliver education in the most under-resourced environments. And there is no environment in the world or no region in the world that is more under-resourced than the African continent. And for that matter, even though the African continent is under-resourced, it has and it will have the largest workforce in the entire world by 2030. And that's something that we will not be able to deny. So the problem was vast, but also at the same time, like it needed to have really, really solid, innovative approaches because otherwise there was no way to be able to tackle whatever the issue was. So for me, the movement into Africa was really to understand that in the most stark context. And to be able to take lessons from a lot of the really, really cool initiatives that are happening on the ground there into the Southeast Asian context. Not to say that exciting things weren't happening in Southeast Asia at the time. They totally were. This was back in 2016 when I was making this decision. But I also think there's something powerful about seeing different contexts and cultures and being able to then tear apart or piece apart what is the same and what is different. So one thing I have now validated for sure, for instance, is that something that is the same across anywhere is how people learn. 
people everywhere learn the same way. There are things that you can do with the way you structure your lesson, what you do to interact with them and what you do to engage with them that are the same, no matter if you're an African or a Southeast Asian. But one thing that's different, obviously are government structures. That's something that on the continent is dealt with very, very differently. Like the way of doing business is very different. And that will also be different here in Southeast Asia. But I think I have solidified now what I feel are solid ideas and innovations, both in the U.S. and in Africa, to then now transfer back into the Southeast Asian context. So for me, it was hard because obviously I want to be home and there's a sacrifice that you make not being on the ground and not being privy to all of the exciting things that are happening. But at the same time, like there is a power to learning in other environments as well first and really picking up the best of what is happening worldwide before bringing it back home. So that's what I wanted to do. And now that I'm here, it's exciting because I think I'm now at that stage where I'm finally like, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to be here. I'm ready to like truly then immerse myself here and then take all of those learnings back into this context. So yeah, I think that was essentially why I decided to start global first and then move back home. So there you are, you've spent a couple of years working in Africa, in America, and then you decided to do your MBA. It's interesting because you're doing this global development work and then you do an MBA of all things, right? (laughs) I say this as another Harvard MBA holder. So just walk us through how you're thinking about that process of like why that degree, why go to grad school? Yeah, it's a really good question also because at the time I was also very conflicted. So there were two avenues I could take, three actually. So the first was to do the MBA. And the reason that I wanted to do that was I was getting too pigeonholed into programmatic elements. I had been known in the organization as somebody who was a good operator, um, really good at curriculum design, really good at team management, all that, but then not really being invited to sit at the table around strategic conversations and also like didn't really have a good insight into how to keep the company financially sustainable. So I hadn't gotten an insight into how it was like to fundraise or at the time like ALU also was working with donors as well. So none of that. So I actually wanted to signal to the world and also to learn for myself, hey, like, this is what it looks like when you lift the curtain and actually sit at the table with the big dogs and aren't just an operator, but are thinking bird's eye view and really thinking long term about where a company is heading. And I thought that an MBA was the best degree that I could get for that, especially with the case method and with the ability to really take the position of an executive in a lot of those conversations that you have in class. So that was why the MBA for me made sense. But then it was very divorced from the education side, obviously. So the second pathway that I was considering was doing a master's in education entrepreneurship. I applied to one at the University of Pennsylvania and also Columbia, or even doing a PhD, honestly. But the reason that I thought that that didn't make sense was because I already had practical fieldwork experience. And I also knew that it was something I loved loved already. And I would continue reading research papers on the side and continue making it my extracurricular. So there was no need to force me to sit down and look at those things, but someone needed to force me to look at financial statements because I wasn't going to do that myself. So that was the second reason or the second way I didn't decide to go down. And then the third is obviously just to come back and to do something new here. But a lot of the reasons that that wouldn't work is one, the questions around, okay, so you just moved from Africa, give us an explanation for that. And then also like not really having the networks or having had the time to like step back and reflect on the time that I had had so far. So it felt too jarring to just move home quickly. And not to mention, too, it would be really difficult, I think, to find openings in companies that I thought would really accelerate my growth where I wanted it to be. So I decided that the MBA was also the best for that, given that it was a transition phase. I could use the time to pivot. And then I could also use it actually to meet people from Southeast Asia again, reestablish those networks. And it helped in all those ways, honestly. And now I actually feel like much more mature, more aware, more ready to come back because of that. So I'm very grateful for the two years that I had at the MBA. So before the Harvard MBA, you were already starting to think about coming back home to the Philippines? I was. It's always on my mind. <laughs> I never. It never goes far from my mind. So what happened? So you did those three years in Africa and America and you're like, okay, I'm starting to get done with this. I'm ready to go back home. Is that is interesting that you discovered this before you went to do your MBA? Yeah, I actually think it has always been on my mind. The long game has always been to be back in the Philippines and do something for Filipinos. One, because 
I still think I know it best out of all the places that I've worked or lived. I am Filipino and I just understand what it's like to be in this context, to grow up in this context, to be a student in this context. So it just made the most sense. But also, I just feel a very, very tight connection with the communities here. And I really feel this urge to be part of a big movement of young Filipino change makers that are trying to make things better. So I had always had it at the back of my mind. So even when I went to Africa, every single thing that I did when I was there, I was collecting in my little toolbox of things that I wanted to bring home. And every single time I was overseas, I still tried to be connected locally. At the time, for instance, I was a consultant for education.ph, which is one of the biggest education startups in the Philippines right now. I was also still involved in the Filipino communities in Mauritius as well. I always still managed to keep one foot or like maybe a pinky toe in the Philippine space and in keeping as connected as possible, especially within the startup and the education landscape. It wasn't a surprise to me. And you know, I was just waiting for the feeling of being ready. And so during the MBA, I started to already feel like, okay, that it's time to go. And so I am now at that point. You're catching me at a good time, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> there you are at the Harvard MBA program. It's interesting because this is your second time back at Harvard. And what would you say is the difference? Because now I assume you already know all the ins and outs of Boston. It was like hang out at MIT and climb the dome and things like that. So I guess this time going to Harvard again, did you prepare yourself differently? Did you have different goals? Did you have a different mindset? To be honest, no, I didn't. I mean, I just really wanted to learn. Ironically, like I actually went to business school to learn, which not a lot of people do. I think a lot of people go for the social time or the break, but I actually really wanted to sit in the classroom and absorb everything that my classmates and my professors were saying. My mindset was very similar in that regard, that it was like a sponge phase for me, which is what I call when I like soak everything in. But in terms of the social aspect, I was definitely very comfortable in Boston. Like I know where everything is, as you mentioned, but I was also young when I was there. I didn't really like feel like I was an adult in college yet, but this time like I lived off campus, had an apartment, and was able to explore the deeper parts of Boston as well. So I think there was just a bigger sense of maturity around how I approached living in the city and um, then how I engage not only the city itself, but residents as well, which I think is different from when you're in college, when you're still trying to find yourself. So I think it was different in a good way. And I guess opened my mind to the cities that we inhabit are so much more than what they are in that moment in time. Like every time I go back to Boston, I feel like I discover something new. And yeah, the thing that I tapped into in the last two years was the education and workforce development community is actually huge in Boston. And I don't think I realized that until I started to expand my boundaries outside of campus. It was only because I had that mindset of, hey, like, let's actually engage the city instead of just engage the student body this time that changed with my perspective that helped me do that. Yeah, because of that, I, I feel like I now have another community of education and workforce development people or VCs and, and entrepreneurs that I can tap into if ever I need any help, which is really cool. Amazing. And this is where it's interesting because you've been thinking about the Philippines for quite some time. You're doing undergrad, you stay connected to the diaspora, you were working and still plugged into the Filipino community in different countries. And this is where you make the decision to say, like, now's the time for me to be comfortable with moving back to the Philippines, which is you know, a big question in every diaspora's mind. So walk us through that final decision where you said, OK, it's time for me to move back to the Philippines. Yeah, I think for me, it was really three things. One, I feel like I have developed my understanding of the industry and the sector of education well enough that I can actually say that I have something to contribute that is not yet here, or at least is like a unique take or approach on how we approach education here in the Philippines. That was something that became very clear to me, especially like doing some VC roles over the last two years where I realized like, wow, I'm getting access and exposure to so many models a lot of which I haven't seen back home. I think that that was one trigger. Hey, okay, you know, I actually have something good to contribute now. The second is in terms of then leadership capabilities. I have been managing people now for maybe like three, four years, and I felt that I needed to grow into it. It was actually very difficult for me, obviously, as it is for most people to then know how to lead teams, much less organizations. I feel like I'm now at that point where I have enough experience behind me on that. 
and on like how to craft a vision, how to align team members to it, you know, so on and so forth, to be able to be ready to recruit young talent, hire young talent, inspire and continue to like guide young talent. That's the second thing. I think it was more on a leadership side. And then the third is on a personal level too, about when I think it would be best to move on a personal life standpoint. I'm breaching 30 in a year, I'll be 30. So thinking really about where do I want to start building my 30s? And you know, that for me really was Manila. That's the time when you're starting to really become mid-level manager, rise up the ranks, starting to establish your deeper connections. And so it felt like the right time from that perspective as well. This is all across the landscape, obviously, of the fact that the Philippines is at a very exciting juncture in its growth as a country. Interestingly, because you have an election coming up as well. So we'll see how that goes. But I personally think that this is the right time to come back and be an entrepreneur in this country as well. There are so many indicators of a growing middle class, like digitization. I know we say a lot of these things for Southeast Asia as a whole, but how quickly, for instance, like e-commerce took off in the Philippines or how fintech is gripping it by storm to me are just signs that we're now shifting in that pathway and time to jump on it. Because if the wave will come and crash, then it'll leave you behind. That's, I think, for me, some of the reasons why I thought now was the time. So in parallel, you're building out kind of career, which is you really putting money where your mouth is. You're starting to build an organization (laughs) and a team for a problem in the Philippines. Tell us more about why this problem and why you're tackling it. This organization actually started in the middle of the pandemic, so last summer. And at the time, we thought it was going to be a tool that would actually help students manage the online learning, e-learning experience, because the Philippines has had the longest lockdown. And also, like, school has been closed for the longest time. We thought, hey, let's build something to help teachers and students connect better in a low bandwidth way. But as we were doing our initial set of discoveries and like user interviews, we found that students actually weren't interested or weren't as worried about the learning piece from an academic perspective. But they were very, very worried about their career trajectories. And this is especially because we were talking to college students in like second, third, or fourth year. And all that we heard over and over again was, I've been attending webinars on Facebook around like skill building because my school is not doing well at that. And I'm really worried about getting a job or landing a job after I graduate. Like, I don't really like my major. How can I like make sure that I'm still preparing for something that I actually want to do as employment, so on and so forth. It was all career related, interestingly. So we actually decided to pivot our idea into now building a career development platform for students in the Philippines that are, I would say, a little bit disenfranchised from the fancy edX and Coursera's out there that are unfortunately, one, two, decontextualized to be able to connect with them. I mean, it's very Americanized. A lot of the topics are actually like too heavy for a lot of the students. And also language-wise, it's actually not easy for a lot of the students to tap into as well. And then finally, too high bandwidth. A lot of people are still working with relatively low speed data bundles and don't want to waste their data on big and heavy video-based courses. We were like, let's build something for the Philippines. And that is actually matching the culture, but also matching the need of the students in a very, very low bandwidth, but still high quality way. That's how we started. And since then, we've been iterating constantly. We've actually did one pilot last October, November, and then we iterated for a few months. And then we actually did another one just this April, May. And we're finally about to launch our two initial products to the public this September. And what we're doing with those products, super excited to share, is we're starting off with bridging what we call the network gap which is really big for students, especially in these underserved environments who don't actually have access to people who can help them understand like what they're interested in, what career they should be going into, like how they should apply, how they should position themselves, so on and so forth. So that's the first thing, the network gap. And then number two, the exposure gap just the lack of information around the different pathways available to you if you're interested in specific types of work or if you just have specific skill sets. Some people don't know that, hey, like they love video editing. You can turn that into a career. And the multimedia space, especially for outsourcing in the Philippines, is growing so huge. So a lot of people just don't know that. You know, it's not something they have access to because they only see people in their communities that don't work those jobs. So there's no way for them to really understand. The two things we're building are tackling the network gap and the exposure gap specifically. We are going to be launching a coach connector, 
which is going to be a coach marketplace where students can easily filter for the type of person they're looking for by role, by industry, by language that they're comfortable with, by platform that they want to speak on as well, and then easily connect with them on the platform. And these coaches are all in the digital space. So they've all held roles in online business, UX, UI design, web development, virtual freelancing, so on and so forth. The students will then be empowered to also use the infrastructure at their disposal to find alternative pathways for themselves instead of being limited to what's in the environment or in the area. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing would be a career explorer, which will be a database of digital careers, which will have information like the basics, average monthly salary, what skills are needed, what companies are often like looked at for this. But at the same time, one thing we're adding as a special unique element is an inside look into what the career actually is. So a day in the life, why the job is fulfilling, what are the biggest challenges of the job. So for that, we've actually leveraged interviews with industry experts. So the idea is, even if you don't have people like that in your community, or even if you haven't been exposed to these careers before, quick search on the platform will actually give you a lot of inside information already that you wouldn't have had otherwise. The students will be able to then hopefully use that information and use the coaching to be able to guide them into a new career journey or career path. So we're super excited because it's really just the beginning of what we're hoping to build as an all around platform for career development. And yeah, we're hoping to even like start doing virtual apprenticeships next year and building out the platform for that as well and getting business partners and stuff. But that will be something that we will do after this launch. So we're doing step by step. And it's exciting because we've already started to see some initial impacts from the students that we've been engaging with. Amazing to see you just doing so much and having such high velocity. When you think about doing all of this, it sounds like you obviously have a big heart for students, the community. Obviously, this is now your first time really back in Philippines, not just being present, but also working and tackling problems of there. Was there any, like, they call it, you know, cultural re-entry shock since the last time you were truly, really part of the Philippines was when 18 years old, so it's almost been pretty much a decade since then? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. There definitely was. I think there were two levels of shock, actually. The first is definitely just being around Filipinos again, the type of conversation, how things are said, different things like that. Very new to me after having lived around, well, like being in America for the last two years and then living around like Kenyans for the most part of the years before that. It's just a different way of relating, different way of talking. I keep being reminded that the Philippines is so emotional in a good way. People are very willing to open up and really be there for each other. And that's something that I have to get used to again, because in the States, you become a bit hardened and you like preserve yourself and hide yourself a little bit. But yeah, that's something that I've had to get used to again. And even just the language actually, like picking up on how people say things now and all of that, I think is also something that I'm adjusting to. And then the second layer of shock is just the Gen Z population, which obviously is my area or like the target group that we're looking after and just how different Gen Zs relate to their devices social media, the words that are being used, just the trends, all that. So I officially am on TikTok, for instance, and I wasn't last year because I want to try to understand, okay, how are the Gen Zs actually, what's entertaining them? Like what's keeping them hooked? That will help with education too, because at the end of the day, if you make education entertaining, then that's the secret sauce that will really bring people to whatever you're building. So yeah, so I think that that's the two layers of shock that I've experienced, but I think I've been able to manage it well with a lot of help help and feedback from my team members. And especially we have interns who are actually Gen Z at Cata Career. So I think they've been teaching me a lot as well. So that's been very helpful. <laughs> so what is it up you to teach you the slang and how to use TikTok? Is that what's happening? Exactly. Like they taught me stand when you stand something. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what a bias was before, but (laughs) I'm learning all of that now. And like, I feel very in the know. Someone told me the other day that I'm pretty trendy for a millennial. So I appreciate it. (laughs) Now I feel so elderly and decrepit. (laughs) We can get you caught up. We can get you caught up. (laughs) Millennials. Ah, that's so funny. And, you know, what's interesting, of course, is that you made a decision to be in the Philippines and be tackling this. What would you say is some advice that you would give to people who are thinking about building something in Southeast Asia in the Philippines? Is there any advice you would give them? Yeah. Interestingly, I had a conversation two weeks ago with an education startup that's trying to bring their online degrees to the Philippines. And we had this exact conversation. And 
I think for me, the first thing is really get into the communities that are trying to serve in terms of be in the spaces that they're hanging out in, have them on your team direct. These interns on our team is so wonderful because they like provide us with perspective that honestly, we would not have even thought about just by living the everyday life of being a young Filipino Gen Z. So really immersing in a way that is authentic, which is hard, especially if like you're a coming from an environment like I did, which is speaking very American like and going to schools like I did, it's hard. Like, so having to shed all of that and maybe have it be in the background and just being just a regular everyday Joe who's sitting down with someone and really just trying to understand how they live. That's the first. The second is, I think, understanding spaces of entertainment or spaces that are just natural for people, you wouldn't necessarily automatically think of as a channel to deliver whatever you're trying to deliver. So with Kumu being so huge now in the Philippines and with TikTok Philippines now becoming such a thing, is there a way to leverage what's already there instead of building from scratch as well? And what things can we leverage there that we can also take and understand as first principles when we design our products too. I think like that's something that we are still trying to like incorporate into our design process. I think that would be the second thing. The third thing obviously is that it's really useful to have key partnerships. We have a very strong board of advisors. And I think without those board of advisors, we wouldn't really know who to tap or which, I guess, LGUs, like local government units or local community leaders to be able to talk to, to then expand our services or expand our influence into certain regions. So just really having a good network of supporters, I would say, that can then vouch for you on the ground and let you know, hey, so-and-so person runs this and maybe you can talk to them to like offer your services there or knowing, yeah, which local government head to be speaking to for so-and-so. So I think that has helped a lot as well, especially for, I guess, like someone coming in from the outside, which is very much like I am now. Yeah. So those would be some things I would think to keep being just humble and the approach to learning more. And something wrap things up here. Could you tell us about time that you have been brave? Yeah. So I think I'm taken back to 2016. So that was essentially when I had been given my notice that I had to leave the U.S. because I no longer had a visa. I was very, very sad at the time. Obviously, I wanted to stay at the company that I was at. I really loved it. And I didn't yet want to go home because I felt that there was still so much to learn. And at the time, I had to like restart my job application process again. I eventually ended up landing two jobs, one in London and then the one in Mauritius, African Leadership University. And the one in London, I won't say which company it is, but it was a lot more established of a company. And to my parents and to everyone I spoke to, it was a no-brainer. Go to London. It's a more cosmopolitan city. The company is more established and more secure, so you won't have anything to worry about. But there was something in me that was really pulling me to work at ALU. There was just something I loved about the vision and about the team members that I had met. But people were like, you even know where Mauritius is. No one had heard of it before. I didn't know a single person on the island. I didn't even know if there were Filipinos there because it's such a tiny island of like 1 million people. So I literally a very, very blind leap of faith into that, despite everyone telling me that I shouldn't. And I think that that was, for me, my best professional decision so far because it really opened the perspective into what it's like to build good education products in yeah, very under-resourced setting, in a very passionate team that all left their places of home to be able to like come into an island in the middle of the Indian Ocean that no one had ever heard of before. Definitely my parents thought I was crazy at the time. I thought I was crazy at the time, but I wanted to be brave because I really thought it was worth the vision and it was worth what they were trying to build. So I'm very happy I did that and I've never regretted taking that jump. Amazing. Thank you so much, Michi, for sharing. So I'd like to wrap things up by sharing the three big things I learned from this conversation. First, of course, is thank you so much for sharing about your personal journey. Especially, I love the part about going to Harvard, how that actually happened, applying, how it actually happened to go in and what you learned there. And to some extent, of course, you leaving and then going back to Harvard again and what you learned there and kind of like taking stock at each stage about it, what you want to learn about the city in Boston, but also your personal geographic decisions as well as career decisions. The second thing I really enjoyed was really what I call like the odyssey between leaving (laughs) Hero's Journey, I guess, from the Philippines and being called to go to America, to work across Africa, 
and then decide that you want to further have a, improve yourself and then eventually make your way back to the Philippines and doing that on your terms with your criteria, with your thinking and your passion, especially for the underserved and the education dynamic of it was just an amazing thing to hear because the self-awareness and the experimentation you had to do in order to find out that this quote-unquote on the mountain that you would die on is a hard thing for many people to discover. So that's really amazing. And lastly, of course, you know, thank you so much for sharing what I call like the dynamics of really being someone in education and looking to be entrepreneurial in that. I especially like the part where you mentioned that you're starting to build out that name for yourself on the programmatic side, but not really being able to be at the table for the donors, for the executive decisions about the sustainability dynamics. And I think that was an interesting dynamic because a lot of similar folks have that problem all over the place. And so I think it's interesting for you to share that in such a clear and direct way. So Michi, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks, Jeremy. Really appreciate the opportunity and yeah, like hope to, to stay connected as you continue also building in Southeast Asia as well. Thank you for listening to Brave. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share this episode with friends and colleagues. Sign up at www.jeremyao.com to discuss this episode with other community members in our forum. Stay well and stay brave. Stay brave.